Welcome, everyone. We are so delighted that you were able to join us today for all of these important conversations. I have been president of the WNBA and CEO of Time's Up, but I also have the privilege and the pleasure of serving as a global board member of Operation Hope. The work we are doing is not only changing lives, it is transforming communities. So let's start our journey toward healing a nation by having this first conversation. Joining us via remote with all this amazing technology, we have Bill Daly, who is the Vice Chairman of Public Affairs for Wells Fargo. Formerly, he served as the Chief of Staff for President Barack Obama and Secretary of Commerce for President Bill Clinton. Likewise, we are joined by my good friend, Chairman and CEO of the National Urban League, Mark Morial. Formerly, he served as Mayor of New Orleans and President of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Welcome, gentlemen. We're delighted to have you. And joining me here in studio, our founder, Chairman, and CEO of Operation Hope, John Bryant. John, over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I want to uh, thank Lisa Borders, uh, who is just a bad sister, as we say, where I grew up. Lisa's a, the former everything, former president of the Coca-Cola Foundation, former head of the WNBA, uh, former president of the Atlanta City Council. Just, just, it goes on, goes on, goes on, and her best years are still ahead of her. She's only 13 now. Oh, I'll take that. All day. <laughs> All day. Um, I want to welcome, um, and I want to thank Lisa for challenging me and the Operation Hope team to do this digitally about six months ago, and vision made real. <laughs> never say no. Never say you can't do anything, ever. Uh, the words can't and impossible don't live in our dictionary. You got to dream big dreams. A, a guy who's on now, a gentleman who's on now, bi li dreams those big dreams and has lived them. Uh, Mark Morial, you might call him Mayor Morial, uh, was mayor of New Orleans. Or as they say, New Orleans, you might say that. <laughs> Nola, Nola. Nola. And um, his father also was an icon in uh, Louisiana. And his whole family is a, a family of change makers. And he now, now runs uh, arguably the most consequential organization for the 20th century and leaning into the 21st century, the National Urban League, which I think helped to lead what I call the second reconstruction. Uh, we had the mm -hmm. first Reconstruction after the Civil War, which was a freedom. You had Frederick Douglass, you know, all these uh, heroes and sheroes, Madam C.J. Walker, et cetera, uh, working blacks and whites, Abraham Lincoln, others working together. Then you had the second Reconstruction, which was we call the Civil Rights Movement. Our mentor, Ambassador Young, who will be with us, uh, helped to lead that with Dr. King. But the Urban League played a, a quiet and sometimes not so quiet transformational role in creating what we could really call today Amer the American black middle class. That's right. Um, and they don't get the credit that they deserve, uh, and they, they're, they're too uh, modest to brag on themselves, so I'm going to brag on them for them. Uh, Mark, we're honored to have you uh, with us today and want to acknowledge you. you first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me, you want to introduce Bill? Or you I do. Want me to... I do. I do. I just wanted to make sure that, that people knew <laughs> no, who thank you were. Let me just say thank you for having me. Thank you for the generous remarks. Yeah. And Bill Daly is a special human being. Um, his family has uh, literally transformed uh, the middle of this country, Chicago, which is the country and it defined the 20th century and arguably the 19th century. His family's legacy on public service is undisputed. Um, probably helped to create a president as well. Um, and Bill has his own legacy. Um, was a member of the president's cabinet. Um, and travel the world promoting free enterprise and fairness, uh, was chief of staff to arguably one of the most dignified, intelligent presidents in the history of this country, uh, President Barack Obama, who I had also had the opportunity to serve as, a, as an advisor. Um, and he is um, a doer behind the scenes. Uh, typically. He, he likes getting things done. He doesn't like messiness. Um, and I commend him today because he stepped 
in to mess today. Mm -hmm. And he's doing it with dignity and, and he's not flinching. Uh, so full disclosure, uh, this forum has for years been sponsored in part by Wells Fargo. That does not mean they get to speak, but if I find somebody at the bank that I think uh, can add value, I invite them. Typically they decline. Um, if I was Bill Daly, I would have declined this year. <laughs> um, but he's a fixer. They, he jumps in and they, fixes they, things. They, so had a, they had a moment. They, yes. At least they've had a moment uh, of what I call unconscious bias a few weeks ago uh, with uh, their CEO, Charlie. Sharf and uh, Bill Daly's the vice chairman. And I've talked to Charlie for an hour at their request. I've talked to Bill Daly for several hours, even on weekends a couple of times, at his request. Mm -hmm. We didn't agree on everything. Uh, it was not a clean, efficient, elegant conversation where you had a beginning, middle, and end, because it's, it's complicated. But Bill Daly has completely leaned in and shows up today because he's got nothing to hide and he has everything, every intention to, to turn this challenge into an opportunity. And for that, I really, really, really respect him. Uh, Bill, you are a great American, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate you. Thanks for being with us today. You're a good man. Uh, so uh, I, I, I just gave that beautiful uh, uh, introduction to Bill Daly, and I told, I'm told that he actually might not be with us on camera. Uh, we'll see if he joins us, uh, he joins us before, we, before we get finished. So, Mark, let's talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about this moment. Um, let's talk about the historic trajectory um, that the Urban League has experienced more than 100 years. Um, and and how, what does this moment mean for you? I, I see it as a moment in history, but history doesn't feel historic when you're sitting in it. I think it just feels like another day. What does it feel like to you? Well, thank you, John, and I, I want to thank you for uh, many years of friendship and for being an institution creator because Operation Hope uh, has become an institution of economic empowerment uh, and financial education, as well as a bridge builder between uh, the financial services industry and our communities across the nation. So thank you for your friendship and thank you for your leadership and for the generous words. We're at a moment that has to become a movement. Uh, and a reflection is if you began by talking about the Clinton years, uh, and uh, I served as mayor uh, of New Orleans during the Clinton years uh, and during a portion of the Bush years, uh, and have served at the National Urban League during the Bush, Obama, and now Trump years. Yeah. And what's striking is how much economic ground we have lost since the year 2000 as a black community and as a nation. Mm. People might say, how have we lost ground? We've been through, we're now experiencing our second economic recession in now a 20 year time period, really in less than a 15 year uh, time period. Uh, black people have lost tremendous amount of wealth. It began during the Great Recession and it certainly did not fully or completely recover and now we have this uh, situation where many people are on the cliff of losing their homes through foreclosure because they've lost their jobs. Uh, we're on the cliff of people being evicted uh, from their homes. Uh, and then we look back and we see a, a fundamental situation where people's earnings, their wages, what people, what people make uh, when they work uh, has not kept pace with inflation for probably 70 to 80 percent of Americans. And that's against a backdrop of a growing economy pre the recession. This is a this is, you know, the beginning of the third reconstruction. Yeah. We have to ensure that it is the beginning of the third reconstruction. Mm. And central to this time is while George Floyd has animated the protest and been the tip of the spear in our, con our concerns about justice, uh, you and I, John, we have to make sure, and, and many on this, that the issue of economic empowerment is on the go forward agenda. Right. Helping people build assets, helping to get investment, private and public investment back in our communities. I was speaking to a group of leaders in Flint, Michigan over the weekend, uh, and what's palpable for so many American cities has been the disinvestment 
Yeah. So we've got to reverse the disinvestment, both public and private, to rebuild these communities and put people back to work, uh, building their communities, expanding the housing and improving the housing stock, uh, improving infrastructure, uh, growing small businesses into medium-sized businesses, and uh, and hopefully global concerns. You know, the, the formula to bring about wealth in, in America is not a complicated formula. Uh, race and exclusion has complicated it for people of color. Yeah. Uh, and if we could get some of the barriers out of the way and make sure that the people of goodwill are determined to not be deterred uh, by these barriers, and if we can align some of the awakening we're seeing in corporate America into a consistent commitment, uh, and if we can get an administration which wants to act uh, in a forthright way to make sure that communities are invested in, we have opportunities and a chance to take this dark time, this difficult time, and make this a time when we begin to turn the corner. Yeah. There's so much, of, uh, and Lisa, you what, lean in whenever you see fit. There's so much, Mark, of what you said that is, I mean, you could spend an hour on if you unpack it. Let me go maybe back up to a couple things that stuck out for me. Um, you and I, um, you more than me, uh, have advised several administrations, and you mentioned, I think you've mentioned Bush, Clinton, and Obama. So the point here is Republican and Democrat. Correct. Uh, and uh, as I look back 150 years ago, it was a Republican administration of Abraham Lincoln, probably meant something different in tone back then, uh, that Frederick Douglass worked very closely with around the Freedmen's Bureau, the Freedmen's mm -hmm. Bank. Um, that, of course, launched the first Reconstruction, uh, which was thwarted, and you had, I think, the precursors to what we call the HBCUs today. Correct. Um, and that sparked uh, the first level of freedom. And you had, soon after that, the creation of the National Urban League, the NAACP, early 1900s, blacks and whites working together um, once again, and, um, and blacks really emerging as these intellectual powerhouses. And mm -hmm. again, both parties uh, finding a way to find some common ground. You don't, you don't always agree, but you try not to be disagreeable. <laughs> and uh, and at every point you've been there, the Urban League has been there in this, these, these inflection points. Um, the last time, Mark, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, it was civil rights, or the right to vote, which you're still pushing, and you guys became a beacon for job training, amongst other things. Am I getting that right, Mark, in the 20th you century? You are, job training, economic empowerment, corporate diversity, yep. home ownership, small business, all of the economic if you will, initiatives. Yeah. And We've been, uh, you know, at the front of. What were some of those, hist no, at least uh, feel free to, to jump in here whenever you see fit. You know. But is there, what was, was there a couple points that you want to raise that people don't recognize about the, yeah, I the think, major things that the Urban League leaned in? And, and well, have? one of the things, we're most associated with jobs. And what that means is in our network of 90 affiliates, uh, uh, every one of them is a place that people can go for help in finding a job. It's a place people can go with help in enhancing their skills. We've also become the, the, the largest provider of uh, housing counseling or home buyer education, which is a form of financial literacy to black Americans. We've got 125 counselors uh, in approximately uh, 50 affiliates around the nation. Uh, we're serving some 30,000 plus people a year when it comes to preparing them to become home buyers. And now, since I've joined, we've expanded uh, our work by providing 14,000 businesses. About 90% of them are black businesses, but we serve uh, all businesses of economic and social disadvantage uh, with uh, coaching, counseling, training, uh, other forms of uh, services. So. What I will say about those programs is they absolutely make a difference. Yeah. 
What I will also say about the, those programs is that their scale is simply not large enough to meet the need. Mm -hmm. That is one of the, 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 the messages I bring to every single president. St don't, you know, you don't look for a silver bullet. Look for things that work and scale them up significantly. Housing counseling works. Yep. Uh, apprenticeship programs work. Yep. Uh, Reentry job plan. training programs work. Uh, and what we are is we're an executor of policy. So in a new mm. administration, we want a bigger commitment, hmm. a more significant commitment to do these kinds of things. I didn't know that, Mark. Uh, the executors of policy. Yeah, they, you got to have the right. For the policy. executors. I mean, policy is on the, uh, you know, is on the drawing board. Uh, and then you've got to execute it. You can draw up a job training program or job training law or job training. Somebody's got to make it work. Yep. Uh, you can you can say let's go put uh, another million black people in homes. You got to execute it. And I think that community-based groups, yours, mine, and others, uh, and we're community-based group, one of the few national yep. community-based groups, or the national that focuses on African Americans, yep. uh, uh, are a, are perfect partners for uh, a a anyone, whether it be a a bank or a financial services company or a local government or a state government or the national that wants to execute public policy with success yep. and with with energy. And that to me is what we have to understand. So I like to talk about our, our uh, re-entry program, uh, Save Our Sons in St. Louis. Uh, we have got a great leader out there, Michael McMillan. Uh, it's a highly successful program with a low recidivism rate. But for every 20 people in the program, there's another 100 on a waiting list. And that, that's the point, right? It's not, it doesn't have enough scale, doesn't have enough investment, doesn't have enough money. It has money to do good, but not to reach enough people because we have to look at the large numbers of people uh, that need to be served. John, we're in a situation where the black home ownership rate has slipped down yep. to almost the 40% range. Yep. That's lower than it was about the same place it was when the Fair Housing Act was passed, Yep. Uh, when the Community Reinvestment Act was passed. So we've lost, you know, 10 uh, points in the home ownership arena. And uh, just count the wealth that has been sucked out, all of the equity that's been sucked out, but all of the hope and the promise uh, of something, of something, of, of, of your own home. So we have a reversal uh, we have to do. and. Uh, you know, attacking racism and attacking policies which create racial exclusion is essential to doing this. It is complicated. And, and I'm hoping that in this moment of awakening, uh, we work on police misconduct issues. Yeah. We work on uh, uh, voting rights. That's yeah. central to the work we do. Yeah. But the economic issues cannot take a back burner uh, if we are truly going to make this a third yeah, I'm feeling bad that I, I've I've loved this conversation so much. I've <laughs> hogged at the time with Lisa. I'm gonna turn it over to her. I will oh, say, Lisa, yeah, hey Lisa, hey Mark, uh, how are you? Hey, fantastic. I can't for some reason I can't see you. I can only hear you. Understood, uh, understood. But uh, listen, you sound fantastic. Let me thank you for your leadership. I want to echo John's sentiments about all the work that the Urban League, National Urban League, has always done. But under your leadership, it's been elevated and accelerated. So thank you for that. And listen, you're working thank on you. the on the uh, demand side. You're building the pipeline. You're getting people ready. You're getting people skilled up and programs scaled up. Let me talk about uh, public policy a second, because you talked about being an executor mm -hmm. of public policy. And when I talk to CEOs across the country, frankly, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of intimidation about the African-American community and communities of color at large. Are you having any conversations about public policy, about getting rid of these barriers to entry, be they real or be they perceived? Because I had one CEO say to me, well, I've seen all the McKinsey studies that saying have diverse, having diverse 
workforces is actually enabling your company to perform better, but I just don't know where to find the people, and then when I find them, I can't relate to them. What do we say to those people who are creating public policy and who are working in the private sector who intellectually understand this is the right thing to do to eliminate racism and raise all economic boats, but emotionally and psychologically, they're not there, Mark. What do we do? Well, they almost have to jump into a pool of very cold water. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's almost a shock treatment. And one of the most important things for leaders is to know what you don't know. Right. Uh, and then know what you don't know and then know what you need to know. So for one to say I can't relate is one thing. To say, you know what, i got to learn to relate. Right. I have to learn to relate is another thing. And it means opening your circle. Uh, sometimes I think corporate executives who are well intended have such small social and relate relationship circles, right? It tends to be people that are so like themselves, right? They don't have a broad span. You know, those of us who that, come that, up that, that might have been Charlie's challenge, by the way, Mark. <laughs> that might have been uh, the, yeah, that might have been his challenge. Charlie's you know? challenge is his right. limited and, circle. And you know, John and Lisa speaking, the three of us, I mean, we, in order to play the leadership roles we've played, we've had to have this relationship circle that is broad and wide. Yeah. You know, I mean, very broad, very wide, multi-racial, multi-generational, multi-economic. Uh, I mean, you know, we have to be comfortable in country clubs and suites if we have to. We have to be comfortable on the street and in the hood if we got to. Uh, you know, we got family members uh, and friends. Uh, you know who, what skill uh, we call that, Mark, right? That, that's <laughs> what cultural, do they call that? You, you know what? That's cultural competence. It's another skill that most yeah, people do another, not recognize that we move from our community to majority communities and back again two and three and four times a day. So it is a real skill when people talk about, are you an analytical thinker? Are you a strategic thinker? Are you culturally competent? Do you have the ability to move smoothly from point A to point B and back again and perform all at the same time? So the cultural and, you competence know, Lisa, is an And issue. that's what some of these corporate leaders may have it yeah. and I've met many who have it and then I've met some who don't have it right. and uh, I think that they've got to understand that you've got to become comfortable your team has to become comfortable uh, in, in a changing world because right now there's some realities that are just so 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 stark I remember listening to Steve Reinemann who was the head of Pepsi in 2003 speak uh, to ELC. First time I've been to an ELC uh, major event. Yeah. And he talked about, he was looking forward. Steve said, we're in 2003. He said, by 2018, half the high school graduates in America will be of color. Wow. Not one. And he was saying to his colleagues in the business community, we have to be preparing for that day. Right. That day is come. Right. And all you need to do is just take the projections forward and it shows you that half of the workers, half of the consumers, mm -hmm. half of the voters mm -hmm. uh, are going to be uh, of color in this country. So it is essential cultural competence. Uh, and, and it's always amazing to me to hear business leaders who lead global com companies struggle with cultural competence where on the global stage uh, they uh, figure out how to understand Germany or Japan or China or other places where they do business. They find people who are bilingual. They understand the culture. So, you know, this this is not anything. Uh, it, it's it's it's. I hope that people have a, a a wide enough mentality to understand that they've got to learn. Now, I've talked to many business leaders in the last six months, many CEOs in the last six months. And the ones I've spoken to, and of course, you know, I, I know it's a narrow group, have indicated a, a, a an enthusiasm and a willingness to try to meet the moment. The recognition that uh, this moment is going to be defined by how institutions respond. Right. Uh, and I think we're at the beginning of that process. And, and, and I've had some candid conversations with business leaders who said, well, what do I do and where do I find and what do I do? And I said, hey. I've said, you're looking for, quote unquote, 
uh, mid-level executives. Mm. I said, hire an African American headhunting firm. That's right. And go go identify the talent that out that's out there. Sits out there. I said, you want to change your entry level pipeline? Audit the places where you recruit. Audit it. Look at whether you're recruiting at schools that do not have diverse student bodies, and whether you've relied on a narrow pipeline to fill uh, entry level positions in your company. So you've got to retool things. You've got it's like a a a, uh, a coach who takes over uh, a, a a football team or basketball team, or and and they're not they're not performing, they're not winning, or they're looking up and they're saying, "Boy, all my competitors." are going to have a whole lot of new players. And then you say, I've got to go get some new players, number two. I've got to change my offensive and defensive schemes a little bit in order to meet the moment and meet the times. And that's what leaders have to do. They can't simply look. Leaders are expected now to lead in a, in a multiple bottom line element. Yeah, you got to get the returns. Yeah, you got to pay attention to shareholders. But you have to pay attention to customers. You have to pay, pay attention to employees. You have to pay attention to the community. Uh, you have to pay attention to the corporate standing, philo philanthropy, and reputation. Mm -hmm. So you have more to do than simply gaze, you know, at a balance sheet uh, every morning when you wake up, or gaze at an earnings statement on a quarterly basis and say, "Whoop, make my earnings target." I can basically <laughs> go back and s go back to sleep. So, I know, so Mark. I don't want to cut you off, but you got all the way to sports. You know, I'm a happy camper now that you brought in that international <laughs> language. <laughs> so, so we're this, this course. This conversation could go on forever. Unfortunately, we're going to wrap this one up. And Mark, I'd like to, to pick this back up with you later uh, uh, on a follow up to the forum because this is a really important, vital conversation. The thing you mentioned about this, the Urban League scaling policy, amongst other things, working with corporations, banks, et cetera, is extraordinarily important lesson. I don't think people knew that. I didn't know that. So that was one of many teachable moments. And we both know, as we conclude here, Mark, that uh, Bill Daly is not shy. So he, he, it was a glitch this morning. We wanna, we're gonna come back and have another conversation with him because he's got a lot of stuff to say. And we wanna say- We wanna it, hear it. We wanna hear it. The world needs to know about it. Thank you, Mark, for being with us today. Hey, thank you very much, John and Lisa. And Absolutely. John, uh, good luck with the forum. Good luck with the annual meeting. God bless you, friend. Thank you so much, Mark.